Father God, Lord, I thank you for each and every God, promise you've given our church, God, every promise you've given us as children of God, and we cling to those, and we call out to you this afternoon and ask for you, God, to answer our prayers, God, to work miracles for us, God, to intercede on our behalf, God, and open doors that no man can open, God. I pray that uh, you can, God, give us an excitement what you're going to do, God, in the coming months, God, in the coming years with this church, God, and that we can have revival in this place, Lord. And I pray this unspoken request, Lord, that you in your own wisdom, God, in your own, God, understanding can answer that you with your boundless uh, knowledge and wisdom, God, can uh, uh, help, God, us through with your vision that goes beyond the immediate, that goes beyond what we see right now, God, and we have faith that you will work wonders for us in Jesus' name. Amen. Take a moment to greet one another, make everybody feel welcome in this place. Amen. I want to thank everybody for coming. Hallelujah. It's great to be in church. If you're joining us online, we count it a privilege to be able to minister to you and to share the love of Jesus. Amen. There is destiny in the house of God. Hallelujah. You uh, be invited to come to our service. Amen. We're behind the Buffalo Wild Wings in Greece, New York. Hallelujah. If you're listening online, you're wondering where we are. Amen. And, uh, you're invited to come here to see what God is doing. A few announcements for the local congregation. We're going to be back in service this Wednesday at 7.30. 6.30 is our time of prayer. You're welcome to join us. Amen. Throughout the week, I'm here in the building. If you want to come at 7 o'clock, I'll be here from 7 to 8 every morning. If you want to come and pray with me, uh, that would be wonderful. We'll touch heaven. We'll touch God. We'll find out what God wants for us. Amen. And he will be glorified in our faithfulness. Hallelujah. This uh, Saturday, we're going to be uh, an outreach at 11 o'clock. You can meet with us here at the building. If you have any questions about that, what to wear and this kind of thing or where we're going, you can contact me and I'll let you in on all the particulars. Amen. We're going to go into the local, con uh, the local neighborhoods and uh, pass out flyers, invite people to church. And then, by the way, there's uh, 3,000 flyers in the back there. You can take a couple with you. And pass them on to somebody you know in your family or in your neighborhood, perhaps uh, at the marketplace. As you're buying your groceries, hand one to the uh, cashier. Maybe she'll come to church. Maybe she'll get saved and she'll uh, thank you for it for the rest of her life. And then in heaven, amen, you're going to see her there. Hallelujah. And she'll be like, remember that day you gave me a flyer? I'll, I'll, never, I'll never forget that day. And amen. God has stored up for the soul winner a crown in heaven hallelujah keep that in mind what god is doing uh we'll be back on sunday morning at 10 o'clock for adult sunday school and uh at 10 30 we'll have our worship service amen god is uh, helping us amen and let's take up our offering if we can change gears here for a moment uh this is about uh the french minister's champagne lobsters and home renovations. We're picking on the French today, I guess. <laughs> so we're talking about money here. Think about it. The money that was wasted, some people might not say it was wasted. I don't know what kind of dinner you have or parties you throw, but they spent more than $70,000. Holy crap. France's environment minister came under scrutiny in July 
when an investigation allegedly found that he had financed renovations and a dozen ritzy dinner parties for 30 guests between 2017 and 2018. The functions featured lobster entrees and vintage wines costing up to $558 a bottle. Oh that God. could pay for your rent for a month for some of you. While the refurbishment cost $70,000 for non-essential measures, such as paintwork, carpet fitting, and fitted cupboards. I don't even know what that means. No. But, amen. So think about the money that is wasted in your life, perhaps. The things that you like to do, and maybe it's not sin, but it's very possible that when you think about money, you don't think about God. He's the last person on your mind. And so when we think about money, we should be remembering that God gives us the ability to get wealth and that God is glorified when the gospel is preached. And uh, amen, when you pay your tithes and offerings, amen, a curse is lifted off of you and you can enjoy the benefits of salvation. Amen, God loves a cheerful giver. Amen, let's go ahead and uh, ask our usher to come forward right now. And we're going to give an offering for the work, amen, that this place could become self-supporting. And Sawyer Van Epps, can you pray over the offering, please? God, I pray that as we give, God, we give an expectation of you to use that money to do with it more than we could ever ourselves. Yes. Bless the gift and the giver and all other offerings amen. besides. Amen. Thank you for your giving. that I would like to share with you as an opening. And that is from C.S. Lewis. He wrote, A creature revolting against a creator is revolting against the source of his own powers, including even his power to revolt. Huh. It is like the scent of a flower trying to destroy the flower. John Kelvin wrote, for there is no one so great or mighty that he can avoid the misery that will rise up against him when he rises and resists and strives against God. The last quote is from Francis Schaeffer. The beginning of men's rebellion against God was and is the lack of a thankful heart. Amen. The title of this sermon I'd like to preach is When I See the Blood. And another name could be Quarantine, COVID-19. 
Let's read the scripture together. Exodus 12, verses 12 and 13. For I will pass through the land of Egypt on that night and will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. Now, and the blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and the plague shall not be on you to destroy you when I strike the land. Amen. When I see the blood. Amen. Our need, first and foremost, is to be protected from the onslaught of hell from what life dishes out and from upcoming and forthcoming judgment against us. So certain times God will require an accountability from us. God is requiring in our scripture an accountability from the land of Egypt. For I will pass through the land on uh, that night and God brings accountability. In other words, God was uh, trying to get his people out of that slavery for a very long time. I think they were in slavery for 400 years. That's a long time. But through that slavery, God made a promise to them that they would be delivered. Amen. And uh, we see the struggle here between, um, you know, God getting his people out of uh, Egypt and Pharaoh's hardened heart. But there will be a consequence. There is a day of reckoning. There is going to be a time when each and every one of us stand before God and give an account for our lives. Like the books will be open and, you know, we're going to see and know exactly what you've done. And God will reveal it to you. The wages of sin is death. In other words, you're looking forward to Friday when you get paid. For some of you, it's two weeks. For some of you, it's Tuesday. I don't know. For some of you, maybe once a month. But you're looking to that day because you're looking, there's going to be a payment or a reward. So for the enemies of God, when an individual chooses to not serve God, they put themselves against God and become an enemy in sorts in opposition. Romans 8, 7. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God and it is not subject to to the law of God, nor indeed can it be. There may be, secondly, the accountability because of a rebellion against God. Proverbs 17, 11. An evil man seeks own rebellion, therefore a cruel messenger will be sent against him. We find in our scripture, in our story here in Genesis, that Pharaoh is rebelling against God. Moses is uh, directed by uh, God in the burning bush, you know, you're going to go and you're going to do this and uh, uh, you're going to say to Pharaoh, let my people go. He goes to Pharaoh and he thinks everything's going to be wonderful. And Pharaoh says, who is God that I would let his people go? I don't know your God. Get out of here. So Pharaoh becomes in rebellion. I will not let your people go. He hardens his heart against God. And for anybody in here who is listening to God, God's giving you some commands or some direction or a way of blessing or a way of cursing. And he's, 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 he's sending you words. He's trying to convince you, do good. And I'm going to bless you, do bad. And it's not going to be so good for you. He's warning them. Many people, they harden their heart against God. And uh, it's a very dangerous predicament that you're putting yourself into. Sometimes, fourthly, we grieve the Holy Spirit. There's an accountability. If we say that we're Christians and the Spirit of God is inside of us, and we decide to go out and do something that is wicked or evil, we're disobeying God, and the Spirit of God is grieved. Isaiah 63, verse 10, But they rebelled against Him and grieved His Holy Spirit. So He became their enemy and fought against them. Here's something interesting that I learned about last week, and that was something called vacating a judgment. Anybody know what this means? To vacate a judgment? You need a lawyer to help you do this. This is when you have a burn, uh, you know, your bridges, and you've uh, you spent so much plastic, you're in credit card debt, this kind of thing. 
Vacating a judgment means legally that you need a lawyer. Quality, legal representation that you can afford. And this advertisement goes like this. Let us help you. Let us help you vacate the judgment. Have you got a judgment against you? Contact us today for free consultation. Extremely low rates. Expert legal uh, guidance, etc., etc. Compassionate staff. The help you deserve. So there's a credit or um, you have a, a debit and there's uh, some problems you've gotten into with your uh, money, perhaps. Creditor, uh, file lawsuits to confirm that you owe a debt and obtain a judgment so that you can potentially be reforced, excuse me, to repay it. So there's going to come a time when you want to buy something maybe or uh, you're not going to be able to get the credit for it or perhaps you owe money on a student loan or some, you bought a trailer or something down the road long ago and you never paid it and they finally found you, they've got your address and they're going to make you pay what you owe. A judgment allows creditors to try to garnish your wages, freeze your bank accounts, or place liens on your property. I think that might go for cars too, especially. In each scenario, the creditor <coughs> COVID-19 the creditor doesn't have to deal with you directly to force you to pay. So they get other people to do that. Additionally, creditors want judgments because they can last up to 20 years and accrue interest. Can you imagine that if you owed money and it was, you know, let's say it was, what's the state charge? You know, 8%. It was going to build up and build up and build up. And from this perspective, a creditor knows even if you are unable to pay the debt now, you may come into your money or property later on in life. And the debt will likely be much larger. Thus, a judgment is security for the creditor and a significant burden for you. So it's a really good idea to not live on plastic. Plastic is so, uh, you know, you think about it, it's such a lie, it's so convenient, you've got it and you swipe it and there's like, hey, I still, my wallet's still full. And that's what we think, we're deceived by that. And so I'm saying that to bring you into the account of our sin and this is, Maybe not for anybody in here, maybe for all of us, that we have an accountability to God. We are indebted to God because of our sin. We've uh, broken certain laws, spiritual laws, and you can't sweet talk your way around it. You know, if a cop pulls you over for speeding, you can't just, you know, shine your pearly whites and say, sorry, officer, I didn't know this feeling. You know, you're not going to get away with it. There's an accountability that comes and in our scripture, God's saying, I will strike the inhabitants, the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast. So Pharaoh had hardened his heart so wickedly against God that God had given uh, the plagues, you know, the plagues, the, um, the locusts and the lice, I came in, in the blood, the water turned to blood, I can't remember all of them, uh, the frogs, um, it's like there was plagues and plagues and plagues, and this is the final plague of the final, the last straw, the final blow against the people, and that is the death of the firstborn. Each and every one of us have positioned ourselves against God and against His wisdom. We've told God, God, I got this. I know what I'm doing. I got it all figured out. I'm all set. We have willingly chosen to sin. We've used our free will to do whatever we wanted. Therefore, because we've been given free will, we're not just puppets, we are going to have to give an account for what we have done with this beautiful thing, this, this life that God has given us, and this free will. I'm thinking about the, uh, the uh, guy who owned the land. He was a vine dresser, and he lent it out to these other men, and they were supposed to uh, tend the land and, and bring the fruit because he was going away to a different country and then there was a time when he was expecting those men to pay up and give the proceeds and the interest and the profits to him and they kept it from him so then he sent other men and he sent other people to gather the, prof you know, the profits and then he finally sent his own son they beat him up, they killed him they said this is the heir you know, we'll just remove him and so there's going to be a day of accountability that many people are not really aware of. People think they're getting away with it. And uh, scripture teaches that men continue to sin because they don't get judged immediately. Like, wow, 
I got away with that. I can do more. And they get into more and they try more. And, and pretty soon there's an addiction there and then they're just bound to that and they're deceived by that. But there will be an accountability. There will be uh, an, a consequence to your choices, your decisions. Second Corinthians 5 verse 10. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether they're good or bad. And third, there's going to be a, a, a judgment against evil. The evil that has brought uh, so much pain into the world and the devil is going to be judged also and every demon will be uh, judged. And the scripture says, and against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. So our hope this evening is that Jesus, amen, when he died on the cross, his perfect blood sacrifice has obliterated sin and has caused us to be forgiven when we put faith in him. Can anybody say amen? Yeah. Amen. That's our hope. That was judgment against sin. Sin is abolished at the cross. And that ought to bring a smile to your face. Every sin you've ever committed and the sins that you're doing now and the sins in the future, God has wiped them away. Amen. He has cast them into the sea of forgetfulness and they are no more. And that's because of the blood of Jesus. Hebrews 9, 14. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself once freely, willingly, without spot to God, he can cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. I had a phone call the other day from a backslidden brother. Backslidden, backslidden brother. He said, I need a cleansing, Pastor. I was like, yes, a cleansing. I never hear that. That's wonderful. Yeah. And God cleanses your conscience from dead works to serve him. Amen. The judgment against evil when Jesus said, it is finished. Yeah. He, uh, I don't know the, the I don't know if it was Greek or if it was um, uh, Aramaic, but he said Eloi, Eloi, Sabbath, uh, and he said, "God, my God, why have you forsaken me?" That's when God's own uh, son's father left him. Amen. God was living inside of him, and all of a sudden, he's by himself, and the sins of entire humanity are placed upon Jesus. And Jesus died. It is finished. That evil has been destroyed. Because Jesus needed to die on the cross. Thirdly, Satan is judged, amen, when he is going to be cast into the lake of fire. Amen. With the Antichrist and the false prophet. We've been studying some end time scriptures in the past three months. Because we see the, uh, the, the, the pages are turning. And we're seeing pestilences. We're seeing uh, some crazy things in our government. Uh, we're also seeing that, uh, you know, President Trump recognized uh, that Jerusalem is the capital of Israel. These are all some markers and signals and uh, uh, signs that we could believe that Jesus is coming back and coming back quickly in a moment's time. And uh, the man of perdition, the... Uh, the great deceiver, the Antichrist, uh, and uh, his false prophet that make everybody worship him, they are going to be judged ultimately. Amen. So the goal for you and I here is to understand in the future there's a judgment against sin, evil, Satan. Amen. And we can put ourselves on the side of Jesus and we can be raptured. We can get out of here before the tribulation comes. Because in that time of tribulation, there will be more judgment against the earth. We don't have to be there for that judgment. You can read all about that. Revelation 20, verse 10. There's also a judgment coming on demons. Amen. There's a place that's been prepared for them. Amen. There's a, a future of torment. These uh, fallen angels. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Yeah. And Matthew 8, 29. And suddenly they cried out saying... What have we to do with thee, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? Have you come here to torment us before the time? Anybody know the scripture I'm talking about? What's the name of, of the man with a thousand demons? Legion. Yep. 
So this is the, the plan of God. To torment us before the time. The time is that there will be judgment in eternity there. And they will have to be judged. Those demons that are tormenting you, that are lying to you, that are twisting scripture around, that are trying to trip you up, uh, trying to get you to backslide, or maybe trying to make you less effective as a Christian, those demons will be judged. Jude 6, verse 6, And the angels who did not keep their proper domain, but left their own abode, he has reserved in everlasting chains under darkness for the judgment of the great day. And then third. We find in 1 Peter 2, 44, For God did not spare even the angels who sinned, but cast them down to hell, delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved for judgment. What is interesting about the plagues that came upon Egypt, lastly, is that they were representing all the gods that the Egyptians worshipped. They're now defeated through all the plagues that have been unleashed upon the people. So let's secondly look at something that's a little more hopeful. Amen. And that is the promises that God has given, that God has written down for us, that we can look and understand that those who are obedient will be blessed. The promise was for them at that time, if you paint your doorway with lamb's blood, on your house, you will be spared. Everybody who is in the house will be protected. Verse 13, now the blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will not pass over you. God passes over our judgment. So you and I deserve hell. Let's be honest. You and I have been disrespectful of God. We haven't listened to him. We have shucked and jived and we have put it off. And so... Because of our rebellion, because of our sin and our choices, we deserve help. But because of God's grace and mercy, he says, no, I would rather that they would uh, serve me and understand that I love them and see through this gift that I've given them that they uh, can be spared from the judgment and the judgment will pass over them. They won't have to suffer that. Now, there's some people here, you don't like that. You want to see bad people get judged. But that's not the heart of God. The heart of God is forgiveness. When a backslider comes in to a church assembly, man, we should receive them if they're sincere. They want to get right with God. We should love them and understand that God does not hate sinners. He loves sinners. Wonderful. And God will pass over their sins and forgive them and wipe their slate clean so that they can start over again. That's glorious. So God sees our sin. He says, this is the way that I can pass over your sins. He spares us. And uh, in the scripture here, he did not include those uh, Israelites, the Jewish people, uh, in the judgment. And anybody else who came into the house, they were protected from that death angel that was stalking in the streets. You and I are the same. We can be spared. We can be protected. We can be different than other people. So firstly, let's look at this. Those who obey are saved. Moses explains to the people what to do to avoid the effects of this final judgment in the drama here. A sacrifice, my friend, is always required when there is an offense. And for the sins of all mankind, that, that called for you know, a pretty big sacrifice, and that was the Son of God. It's Jesus himself died for our sins. A sacrifice is always required to avoid the full blunt of an offense. Secondly, God has provided a sacrifice through the blood of his only Son. Thirdly, Jesus' blood is pure. And Jesus was tempted like you and I, but he never sinned. And this is the full payment of men's freedom. We can be freed from slavery. And this is what many people don't understand is that to Jesus' blood has paid in full our freedom. So it's the picture of a slave block. When slaves were sold, they were put up on a block. And they were there, they could have been naked, or their family could have been there, and they're trying to sell these slaves. This is exactly the way you and I have lived. We have lived in slavery 
to mindsets, to racism, to uh, anger, to uh, drugs, immorality, perversion, all these things. We were in bondage to them. And God says, I'm going to pay for him because I love him. What's it going to cost? And Jesus said, I got the money right here. I paid for Mark's sins. I paid for Melody's sins. I pray for everyone here for their sins with my own blood because I love them and they're worth it. And then you get off the slave block and now you're free. When the blood is applied by faith to our sin, we become forgiven and saved. I imagine that even some of the Egyptians that were there knew the power of God. They were trying to talk to Pharaoh. Pharaoh, you need to let these people go. Look at our crops are destroyed. Our cattle are dead. Everything's going under. Please. So some of them had some wisdom. They probably went into the houses on that night and they were spared if they were the firstborn. So probably they men spent the night there or maybe they even lived with them and left with them perhaps. So secondly, to be in the world but not of the world. So I want to talk secondly about our need to make good decisions as Christians. 1 John 2, verses 15 through 17. And God is telling us, you know, to be in the world, but not of the world. We're called to not leave our culture and society, become hermits in the wilderness. Some people uh, prescribe, you know, you need to be like the, the, uh, the Amish people. They don't have any, um, you know, zippers or whatever. They just have <laughs> buttons, uh, you know, no electricity, I guess. There's secret cults that people invite you to be a part of, uh, a fellow just told me about a book that was written in 1976, I think, uh, and that's the religion he, he follows, uh, A Course in Miracles, just, just, whoever heard of that, you know, it's just, and then you have the Jehovah Witness weirdos, people that, you know, don't let their uh, kids get vaccinated, or people that have, uh, you know, an aversion to donating blood and this kind of thing, no birthdays, come on. Wow. So we're called not, not to get out of the world, but we're, we're in the world and we're called to live with other people in relationships, our families. You know, even though we're Christians, we love God. We don't want to just like push everybody out of, out of the way. The Jews avoided the judgment while living in Egypt, but protected by the blood, the blood that was painted over the doorpost. And it was for protection. There was a distinction there. Amen. This also carries a re-emphasis of the power in God's house, the church of the living God. That's what you and I are enjoying tonight. Amen. His presence, you could feel the wonder of salvation, God's Holy Spirit, when we were lifting our hands and singing songs to Jesus. Amen. Hebrews 10, 25. Do not neglect the gathering of the assembly. Because we're called to encourage each other when we come to church. It's just exciting to be here. It's great to see everybody in their place. Amen. And everybody adds to the service. It's very exciting. Very powerful. Amen. When we're in church, amen, it's supernaturally. We're protected against judgment. It's like you're in the house of God. And because you're saved and you're living for God, there is a protection that is... Uh, guarded against you from judgment. However, when we remove ourselves from church, we uh, remove ourselves from God's protection, and we find ourselves you know, away from God. We find ourselves slipping into sin, maybe, or into different weird things, and we understand that you know, the protection, the guidance is missing and who knows what kind of demonic influence we're setting ourselves up for when we get out of church. Amen. Amen. And out of the relationship that God has destined, designed to protect you. Friends that can speak to you. Uh, people in your life that can encourage you and keep you from untold horrors of making bad choices. Amen. Secondly, look at the quarantine. And then everybody's been suffering through the quarantine for the past few months. How many people enjoy the quarantine? Some people do, but I don't. <laughs> oh, <that's right. laughs> Great. So one thing that I've noticed is that, you know, it brings your family closer together. Yeah. 
yeah. it can be good or bad. Amen. But it's been very good for, for us, and um, we're not just persevering. And we're, you know, we want to see things go back to normalcy. Thank God we got our church back opened up. Yeah. And we can see people. We can shake their hands. It's glorious. Amen. And be in relationship with people. But there is a certain safety that is enjoy when you're, you know, stay inside, flatten the curve, it said. Staying inside. God protects us when we're in good relationship with Him. When we are in church, when we're quarantined, we're inside, protected. So, the last thing that I would ever try to preach to you is to try to conform. Uh, because I used to be a hippie, and anything goes with a hippie, you know that. And there's no way that I'd ever tell anybody, you know, you should really come to church, you know, come every week, you know, come three times a week. I would have never done that. And, and I wouldn't do that now, except that it's so good to be saved and to be quarantined as it were, to come to church and to uh, not conform yourself to the world, but be transformed in your mind, amen, to, that you can be renewed. And that all happens because you come to church. Making church a priority in your life yields great results. Maybe once a week, twice a week, three times a week. Maybe you want to fast with us. Tomorrow we're going to be fasting. I forgot to announce that. It's kind of like one of those things like, uh, here's your uh, cod liver oil, you know, Junior. you got to take this or eat your vegetables. Some of us hate vegetables. And so, but we're going to be fasting uh, Monday through Wednesday. Amen. And you're welcome to join us. We're going to be at a water fast. You can maybe fast one day. That would be greatly appreciated. We're going to fast for the uh, conference, Windows of Heaven. And uh, amen. let's get back into the sermon. Hallelujah. So thirdly, there's a need to um, an understanding of the blood of the Lamb. And God promises us that. Uh, amen. This thing called Passover. This is a a celebration or a, a, a remembrance. The Jewish people do this. I think this was um, in the middle. Passover this year was on a Wednesday. It was in the middle of the uh, COVID-19 crisis. But what was noticeable to me was on that day, that was when the curve started to go downward. Some of you might have noticed that. But uh, aside from that, excuse me, um, the Jewish people choose to remember this day because the, the sins uh, uh, and the offenses uh, and the judgment was passed over their houses because of the blood in uh, Egypt at that time. They choose to not forget how God passed over them because why? He saw the blood. Let me ask you this evening, when God looks at you, He looks at your heart, nobody knows what you you know, what you're going through, what's going on inside of your mind. But when he sees you, does he see the blood? Or does he see a fine, upstanding citizen? You know, anybody can buy a suit from uh, Marshalls. You can dress, you know, you can look nice. Um, what does God see, though, really? What did he see when he looked at all of uh, uh, Jesse's sons? When Samuel was trying to find the next king of Israel? He saw Eliab was really tall, broad shoulders. No, not this one. What does he see? Does he see someone who's self-righteous? Someone who has had a born-again experience? Or who has become cleansed by Jesus? And that's what we want him to see. We want him to see our sin. We don't want him to see our heart, our wickedness, our evil. We want him to see Jesus and Jesus' blood that has washed us and cleansed us. Or perhaps he sees someone, God forbid, someone who has once been forgiven of their sins, but said, yeah, I don't want to do that anymore. And they go back into their old lifestyle, their old way of living. They've forgotten the amazing things that God has accomplished in their lives, setting them free from bad relationships, poor decisions, poor planning, wasting of money, years of just insane living and they've traded it for a cheap thrill or a temporary high. What does God see when he looks at your heart this evening? Amen. Let's close uh, very uh, rapidly here. Freedom is accountability. And the plague shall not be on your house to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. 
So let's talk for a minute here in closing about Christian liberty because many people get this kind of idea confused. Uh, there's a Christian liberty to sin. All things are lawful for me, 1 Corinthians 10. But not all things are helpful, verse 23. All things are lawful for me, but not all things edify. So Paul is teaching us here that we are free to do many things because we know we'll be forgiven of our sins. God will hear me. He's faith. I know his character. I can uh, live this way or do this thing, whatever it is. But will it glorify God? Think about your behavior and your habits as seen or perceived by maybe a, a regular sinner or a, an unbeliever. What do they see when they're looking at you? Will this bring them a good example of what it means to be a Christian? We will become severely accountable to God because we have been forgiven. So we're brought into a place. We can do whatever we want. God will forgive you again. Yeah, no problem. But what are people going to do with that information? Are they going to believe you when you say Jesus loves them? They're, they're going to think you're a joke because you're... You're living like the devil. You, uh, you know, you party on the weekends, and you put, you know, you put on a, a fine uh, suit. You come to church, and you look great. But this is not real Christian living. You have a liberty to do that. You can be forgiven, but this is not the way. Sometimes Christians use this phrase to justify their worldliness or their carnality. Christians aren't perfect. We're just forgiven. That can be very dangerous. Or when they go out and sin, they say, oops, sorry God, my bad. <laughs> That's not going to fly. Sloppy agape, have you ever heard of that? How about greasy grace? <laughs> fake forgiveness, fake repentance. They don't sound as good, but I tried to make a couple more for us. Hebrews 10, 26. This is kind of scary, so think about this. If we sin willfully after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful expectation of judgment and fiery indignation which will devour the adversaries. Just something to think about when you choose your Christian liberty to go out and do what you want to do. So we learn lastly that those who are unbelievers will be punished when I strike the land of Egypt. People who act wickedly will be corrected and backsliders will be reproved. The whole experience of disobeying God by willfully living in sin is a judgment in itself. Many times, you know, you can maybe see people preaching on the streets or you can uh, come across a Christian radio station or maybe somebody will begin to witness to you at work and tell you, you need to repent, you need to change. Well, sometimes... That's not going to work. God needs to speak to people to show them that they're going to be punished. And in a way, they already are being punished because they have no joy in their life. Think about David when he had uh, uh, murdered Uriah the Hittite, the husband of Bathsheba. His bones were aching and inside. He was miserable. All his relationships were not right. There was no joy in his life until he repented. We also have forgiveness by the blood. Christians enjoy the benefits of salvation because we have been washed in the blood. And uh, look, looking forward to the escape or the deliverance, the freedom that the slaves enjoyed when they left Egypt, they actually plundered them. And uh, the Egyptians gave them jewels. It says here in Exodus 12, now the children of Israel had done according to the word of Moses, and they asked the Egyptians for articles of silver, gold, and clothing. And the Lord had given the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians so that they granted them what they requested. They plundered the Egyptians. And the children of Israel journeyed unto Ramses and Succoth, about 600,000 men on foot, besides children, about a million slaves. Lastly, God sets free the captives. He gives them a new life. This is you and I. We are delivered from bondage in slavery. 
And God sets you and I on a course of discovering his promised land. We are released. So some of us, we may wander in the desert for 40 years. I hope it's not that long, but God's promise for you and I is a land flowing with milk and honey and blessing to come to those and who understand the Passover and that our sins are forgiven and our responsibility to, amen, serve God and keep in mind, amen, that he uh, will bring us into account for every evil thing, but also every good thing that we have done. Amen. Why don't we close our eyes and bow our heads with no one moving around. Amen. And this is for those perhaps this evening you're not saved. Maybe you're listening online. You're not born again. You are still a slave. You're still like in Egypt. And uh, you have no freedoms. You're involved in sin, some kind of sin. Maybe you drink alcohol. Maybe you're uh, an alcoholic, maybe you're doing drugs, maybe you're a heroin addict or you're living some perverted lifestyle, you uh, are adultery or fornication, I don't know, some immoral thing that you have been in bondage to, you can't be free. And there's self-help programs, there's books that you can read about your bondage, whatever that is, it's harmful to you, it's killing you, it's killing people around you, it's destroying relationships and you're wasting a lot of money. But Jesus said, I have come that they might have life and life more abundantly. Amen. And this is what Jesus has performed for us when he, by his own blood, amen, that suffering on the cross has given us a way out of our slavery and sin. And Jesus wants to set you free. And I, you're listening in line or you're in the congregation and you're not saved. You haven't a relationship with God through Jesus. And he loves you. He wants to give that to you. Jesus wants to make you born again and have a brand new life. But your sin is what's killing you. Your, just, your, dis, just, your decisions that you've been making is destroying your life because of sin. There's no forgiveness or remission of sin without the shedding of blood, the Bible teaches. And there's an accountability that you are being brought into. God wants to bring you joy, wants to bring you happiness and fulfill your life and set you free. But you have to pray. You're going to have to surrender your life to God. And He loves you so much. He died for you. And if you'll be honest, you've not figured it out. And you want to get saved tonight. Amen. With no one moving around, I want you to lift your hand. You want to get saved. Give your life to Jesus. You've never prayed a prayer of repentance or answered an altar call. Or perhaps you're online. God's revealing things to you. It's like he's, he's tearing back uh, this fabric. Which you can see into eternity. You can see heaven. And God is reaching down and showing you that he does love you. He's committed to you. He wants to save your life. Give you hope. Amen. Maybe you are uh, backslidden. That means you were serving God at one time. But for some odd reason, the cares of this life have choked the life out of you. Have choked the fruitfulness out of you. Or you've been tempted to go back into your sin or pursue the pleasures of this world to no avail. And it's left you clueless. It's left you broken and worse than you've ever felt before. And you have failed miserably. God's calling you to come back. Amen. He loves you. He wants to reestablish that relationship. He'll restore the years which the locusts have eaten. And the things that you've destroyed by choosing to sin. He wants to give you life. Amen. Maybe you're backslidden tonight with no one looking around. If that's you, you're backslidden. And you want to pray tonight and give your life back to Jesus and come under his care and protection. I want you to do me a favor. Can you lift your hand? Or maybe you're online. And that's you. We're speaking to you. God's tugging at your heart. Amen. You can pray a prayer of repentance. Amen. And God will show himself to you. Uh, let's change the order of our service. And that is for the Christian here. The blood-washed saint. You have a, a relationship with God. Amen. Something about the house of God. It's something about being inside of God and in good relationship with Him. He'll wash you in His blood. He'll give you power, amen, through the Holy Ghost. And uh, 
you can become a powerful testimony of the Lord Jesus and his working in your life. And you can become fruitful also and find your promised land. Let's open up our altars if you want to come forward and pray for anything, for any reason. Amen. We're going to do that right now. And we're going to sing this worship song before we close. Amen. You're holy. I saw the Lord. you have any pain in your body? Can we pray for you? Why don't you come up here? We're going to pray for you, man, because this is a New Testament church. Amen. Yeah. And so, how can we pray for you? Um, without going into a lot of detail, I'm, just, I'm dependent on some medications, but the medications really cause a lot of problems, also side effects. So I just, you know, wish that God would, like, deliver me or just help me to, like, you know, just give me the strength, whatever, as well as, you know. To not use the medication anymore? I mean, I would never go off of it abruptly, but I just, I guess just that God would maybe, like, make a way for me to be on less medication or something. Praise God. Yeah. Let me hold your hand. Let's pray. Everybody lift your hands and pray for our sister. In Jesus' name, we take authority over this right now. Why don't you pray when you say, Jesus, I thank you for miracles. I thank you for miracles. I thank you for your blood. I thank you for your blood. I'm asking you to wash me. I'm asking you to wash me. Cleanse me. Cleanse me. And make me a new creation. And make me a new creation. I speak into the sickness. I speak to the sickness. You cannot have my life. You cannot have my life. I am delivered. I am delivered. And I am free. I am free. By your stripes. Yeah, by your stripes. I am healed. I am healed. I thank you for the cross and the resurrection. I thank you for the cross. You are my God in covering. Mm -hmm. And the resurrection. You are my God in covering. And I believe tonight for a miracle. And I believe tonight for a miracle. To heal me from the effects of this medication. To heal me from the effects of this medication. And release me completely. And release me completely. From any of this that is bothering me. From any of this that is bothering me. Or hindering me from serving you fully. Or hindering me from serving you fully. I thank you tonight. I thank you tonight. And I believe you for a miracle. And I believe you for a miracle. Amen. Let's worship God. Thank you for Yay. my sister, God. I thank you for her life laid down, God. You're going to touch her, God, with your power and your blood, Lord God. Release her. And I speak unto these things that are inside of her. Release her. You cannot have her soul. You cannot have her body. She is blood bought in full by Jesus' blood. We thank you. We believe you tonight. Amen. Amen. Lord bless you. Let us know okay. what's going on. What can I pray for you for, brother? 
Um, I've actually been um, very, very uh, in a lot of pain for a lot of my life. And what specifically where? Uh, mentally, physically, spiritually. Okay. Um, I've been uh, in a lot of pain, mostly physically, right here in my leg. Um, Let me see you squat down. Go all the way down on the ground. What? Can you do this? <laughs> Pray for our brother right now in Jesus' name. Loose him right now by the power of the blood of Jesus. We thank you for anointing. We thank you for raw unction. Lift your hands up, bro. And let's worship him right now. God, heal us by... We speak unto this pain, this weakness in his knees and his legs, Lord God. Give him his own miracle, Lord God, I pray. And release him from the past. Break every curse. Jesus be glorified in every day of my brother Mark's life. Amen. Hallelujah. One more thing I have to ask. Pastor. Yeah. I, uh, as you know, I do take medication as okay. well. I take about 18 pills a day. Wow. Well, okay. And that is mandatory from all my psychiatrists. Yeah, I saw you pop yeah, the, yeah, the, the pop bottle the other day for the milk. Guzzle them all. Like, yeah, so yeah. do you think that's right? No. Okay. Because pharmaceuticals is also a business. Yeah, so uh, we're going to consult your doctor. And if you want to, maybe you can I'm somehow pray to get on less. Get on less, yeah. Well, yes. well, we can believe you that you can be delivered completely one day. Mm -hmm. Amen. You know, that, that would Amen. be the goal. And so I'm not going to say go cold turkey. I would never do never. that. Right. But I'm going to pray for you right now. That'd be highly that whatever they're do I mean, I I imagine most of them are for your mental processes, right? Mm -hmm. So it's possible that over time that you become dependent upon you know the medication to help you make decisions and handle stress or whatever this kind mm -hmm. of thing. So to get off of them is going to be a process. I would never suggest go cold turkey, but let's no. make that the goal this year that you could be completely free of every last pill. Amen. So I'm not going to say don't don't. You know, go home and throw them in no, the No, 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 I would never. But we're going to, you know, begin to pray. We're going to talk to your doctor, talk to your family, and you can be delivered, man, because God wants you to be free. Amen. Amen. All right? Doesn't want you to be a drug junkie. No, I don't, I don't want to. Right? <laughs> You're a man of God. Yes. You have the Holy Spirit living inside of you. Yeah, yes, amen. You speak in tongues. Yes. You're doing righteously. You're making good decisions. Oh, yeah. God's smiling on you. And God's going to deliver you from that need to. So lift your hands Let's pray, Lord, deliver my brother right now from every medication, every uh, uh, bondage to that, God, every uh, uh, need for that, I pray. Release his mind, God. Break every curse against him. Heal him, Lord God. Give him joy in that day, Lord God. Loose him, God, for healing and fruitfulness. Thank you for letting me pray. God love you, man. You're awesome. Thank you. You can return to your seat. Thank you. Amen. Thank you. Thank you so much. Amen. What a wonderful presence we have that God is here helping us. Amen. Thank you. If you're online, amen, come and see us. See what God's doing. If you have sickness in your body or something in, you know, your life that you need miracles with, we will pray for you. We're located in the Toys R Us Plaza in Greece, New York. Amen. Let's go ahead and, and praise God. And when we're done praising God, so our Van can pray for us. <laughs> spoken today, and those words that are written in the Bible, God. Give us traveling mercies as we go in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Lord bless you. We'll see you. Uh, we'll be back on Wednesday night. Amen. Make everybody feel welcome, and uh, have a good week. <laughs>